So the it's going to be a wide topic uh, to discuss today. And uh, my focus is going to be I've just broadly classified like this so that um, I, I aim to cover as many as I can. Um, so very briefly, why is surgical resection needed um, for colorectal metastasis? Then with regards to diagnosis, both um, in terms of trying to I make mean, investigations, both in terms of diagnosis and in terms of uh, assessing patients and the liver for resections, then um, uh, role of chemotherapy very briefly, and most importantly, the algorithm for managing synchronous and metachronous liver metastasis, then uh, improperative strategies very briefly, and type of liver resections, and a bit more on management of bilobar disease. Uh, I'll touch upon two-stage liver resections, different types, including ALPS, then ICG-guided liver resections, then about total vascular exclusions, and, and uh, very briefly upon some clinical trials, which I've been part of on the European side. So this is uh, the reasoning why we should be doing liver resection for colorectal liver metastasis. As, as you can see, this includes all stage colorectal liver mats, um, irrespective of the number of liver mats, the size of liver mats. As you can see, there's a significant difference in the five-year survival between resection and palliation or best supportive care. So that's the reason we still keep doing surgical liver resections. So coming to investigations. So this is all the diagnostic investigations. As, as you all know by this time now, it's a, the, the carcinoembryonic antigen is it's not diagnostic, but it's very prognostic. So what I mean by that is in somebody who has got a high CEA, it's very useful postoperatively to see if they develop any recurrence. And uh, it also helps to, to an extent to assess the severity of the colorectal liver metastasis, which I'll touch upon a bit later. Um, and uh, the role of CT, so all the patients with colorectal liver metastasis have to have a full thoracic, abdomen, and pelvic CT. So it's very important they all have thoracic CT, as you, as you all know. The, more, second most common site of spread for colorectal liver mats is lung next to liver. And regarding the low role of MRI liver, it was slightly controversial before, but now we know clearly, at least from the NICE guidelines from for the UK point of view, all patients who are going for liver resection need to have an MRI. I would probably extend this to say that all patients with colorectal liver mats should have an MRI liver for the reasons I mentioned there. So one is to characterize indeterminate lesions. So sometimes you see a few lesions and some of them you can't really characterize. So it's very important to have MRI up front. And second thing is, most of the time you end up picking up a few more lesions compared to CT. But still intraoperative ultrasound is the gold standard to pick up any new lesions. So it's important still, every patient have to have an intraoperative ultrasound, but preoperatively it's important to have an MRI liver. What's the role of CT PET? Again, this is very controversial. A lot of centers just do on a routine basis. Again, it depends whether it's on the public sector or private sector, but we don't do it routinely. And, and uh, the indications we have are if you have an indeterminate extra hepatic disease, like you see some momental thickening, or you see some nodules around the left upper quadrant, you're not entirely sure, then it's definitely worthwhile doing a CT PET. And I've just written here, disproportionately high CEA. Again, it's a very controversial one. So we have CEA of about three or 4,000, and you just have one liver met. You're worried that you're missing something. It's probably worthwhile doing at the time. And the third one is higher number of poor prognostic factors. So this is on the FONG score. Again, I'll touch upon it a bit later, what I mean by this. So essentially, if you have three or more of the risk factors, you should do a CT pad because you're missing something else. And then coming to biopsy. So we don't do routinely biopsy, uh, but it's definitely useful if, if there's a diagnostic dilemma. Coming to the investigations for planning for surgery. So the key thing about liver resection for colorectal metastasis, or even for HCCs for that matter, is how much of liver you're leaving behind. It's not, it doesn't really matter in a big way 
what you're going to take out. The key thing is what you're leaving behind. So the aim is to leave at least 25, 30% of a healthy liver. Having said that, most of your patients would have had some form of chemotherapy. So if you're having a patient who has got a very fatty liver, either because of obesity or post chemo, then it's important that you need to leave around 40% of this liver. And the next important component is this segment of liver which you're leaving behind has to have a good inflow, a good outflow, and good biliary drainage. So that's the crux of your liver surgery. So how do you assess this preoperatively? So I mentioned a couple of things here, anatomical and functional assessment. So this has evolved over a period of time here. So there are different softwares available now to do anatomical assessment. The ones we use here locally is Synapse and, and most of the uh, live donor centers use something called Mavis, which is a German one. And this functional assessment is by uh, spec CT. I, I'll elaborate a bit more on that. So this is just to give a picture of uh, a Mavis. As you can see, a large tumor on the right side. So you have this where you can assess the inflow very well. So this gives you an idea of which segments you're going to take because you know exactly which vessels are involved. So you can assess most of this by your CT or MR, but this gives you a three-dimensional view, which, which makes it a lot more different when you're planning for an operation. So this adds on your venous return, the, the hepatic veins. So again, to plan a resection. So functional assessment. So this we have started doing over the last, I would probably say four or five years now. Um, Again, there are different ways of doing it. We have tried different uh, modalities, including ICG and all that, but this seems to be the most reliable ones we've got now, which is the uh, meprofenate scan. So the technician meprofenate is similar to your bilirubin. So it's taken up by the liver and it's excreted without undergoing any metabolism in the liver. Uh, so it's excreted to the biliary canicoli. So it's one of the good ones to measure, similar to ICG, essentially. So, so this is a study in 2010 based on the meprofenate scan, how much you need to leave behind. So basically the key figure is this, it's 2.69. So that's probably the number you need to remember. So this is the number which is the percentage excretion per minute per square meter. The beauty of this scan is you can measure purely the future liver remnant and exclude the part of the liver you're going to take out. Unlike ICG, which is a global measurement. So if you mark your line of transaction and tell your radiologist, this is what I'm going to leave behind. So he tells you, he comes up with a figure. And if it's about 2.69, your risk of post-hepatic liver failure is significantly low. So you're safe to proceed. So this is the number, key number to remember. So I'll give you a couple of examples here, how an objective assessment could be very misleading. See this uh, SPECT CT. As you can see, the one marked in the red is a future, future remnant, and one green is the one who's going to come out. So in this patient, Grossly, it appears small, but you look at the functional uh, FLR, it's 2.79, which is above the cutoff. So you're safe to go ahead with a very low risk of post liver failure. Look at this one. Grossly looking, the FLR appears adequate. But look at the number, it's 1.87. So it's very important to know the functional assessment of the FLR, especially in the current climate where you're using more and more chemotherapy liberally because the volume may appear completely okay. So here, if you see the volume is 30.2%. So you may, if you go purely by the volume, you would probably go ahead and resect and end up with the post liver failure. So it's important to know the function of the FLR. So all the investigations done now. So the next is, when would you give chemo? Do you want to give upfront chemo or you want to give adjuvant chemo or no chemo at all? So the role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy Again, our, our practice has changed significantly over the period of time. And almost always, every synchronous presentation, we give neoadjuvant chemo. So when I mean by synchronous is the definition we use, again, it's variable in the literature. Some people say six months, some 12 months. The definition we use is, is six months from the diagnosis of the primary. And then borderline resectable metachronous disease. So what I mean by this is if you're struggling with an FLR, to go for an upfront liver resection, then go for chemotherapy. Or something which a lesion is close to your outflow or inflow, which is going to take a substantial volume of the normal liver, then go for a neoadjuvant chemo. The so third one is what I mentioned again here, FONGS criteria, which I mentioned in, in the CT PET. So as you all know, the FONGS criteria, it says uh, no positive primary, 
short interval between the primary and the liver mat, the number of liver mat, size of the liver mat, and the CEA value. So if you have three or more, you know this patient has got a poor prognostic factor. So you don't want to go for a resection because you may encounter early recurrence. So what you want in these situations is to have a systemic control of the disease before you go back and take out what's remaining. So in these situations, definitely you would like to give a neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This is probably one of the important slides, I would say, uh, in this presentation. An algorithm to manage a primary with a liver mat. So let's start from the top, synchronous presentation. So I've got a separate slide for the metachronous ones. So it depends whether the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic. Let's focus on the symptomatic ones. For example, if it's a right-sided lesion who is bleeding or a left-sided lesion who is obstructed, so you would like to go for a primary resection or sometimes diversion or stenting. So treat the symptoms first, either with the resection or with the diversion. And then depends on whether it's a colonic disease or a rectal disease. So in this, at this point, it is same as for asymptomatic disease. Again, let's focus on the colonic one. So you would like to give neoadjuvant chemo and then go for a primary resection if you're not resected before and then go for a liver resection and then adjuvant chemo. If it's for rectal tumor, the situation is slightly different because you would like to give chemo rad. Again, whether it's short course or long course, I think in the UK, it's decided by the oncologist and the colorectal surgeon, so we don't get involved in that. So once they make the decision, if they go for a short course chemo, which chemo rad, which essentially controls your primary and your chemo acts as a radio sensitizer, it's not a proper systemic chemo. So in that case, you go for a primary resection after that and then a liver resection followed by a joint. But if you're going for a long course chemo rad, so you've got good control, and after long course chemo rad, our colorectal surgeons hesitate to go for a colonic resection within a short period of time because of risk of anastomotic leak or risk of tricky dissection and significant bleeding. So they normally would like to wait for 12 weeks. So we try and utilize that time of 12 weeks to go for liver resection. So this is one of the indications where you try and do a liver first resection following a long course chemo rad. So then you go for a primary resection and then go for adjuvant chemo. So coming to metachronous, it's slightly simpler algorithm. Again, metachronous defined as, defined as more than six months uh, after your primary, and assuming in this situation, it's primarily treated. So you have a resectable disease, go straight from up, upfront liver resection. We are currently involved in a number of trials where we're looking at different things, but as far as the current situation is concerned, we go for a liver resection. And the role of adjuvant chemotherapy is debatable. There is no evidence in literature as of now to say that this increased in survival benefit if you give adjuvant chemo in a metachronous setting. But again, there are situations where you may like to give, like an R1 resection or a high bulk disease, microvascular emission. So it's individualized, but in general, we don't give adjuvant chemotherapy. If it's borderline resectable, as we discussed before, we'd like to give neoadjuvant chemo and then go for a liver resection. What I'm not included in this slides are inadequate FLR. So there are lots of ways to improve your inadequate FLR. I will touch upon those ones when I come to uh, two-stage liver resections because it's more relevant there. I briefly touched upon this, liver first resection. So there are essentially only two indications, accepted indications we practice currently for uh, liver first resection. One, as I mentioned, following long course chemo rad um, in rectal cancer, and then high liver burden disease. So if your liver disease is going to determine the long-term survival, let's say bile over, significant bile over disease, or a large tumor compromising the middle vein um, uh, involving the right over the liver, so you would probably like to take the liver out first and followed by primary. So when do you do simultaneous resection there, because again, our practice is, is um, sequential resection. The reason behind is the colorectal is a separate specialty from HPB in the UK, which makes it a bit tricky, both logistically and expertise-wise. But I, I presume in Sri Lanka, you are surgical oncologist, probably you've got a skill to do both. So in those situations, there is an opportunity to do both because as patients, you probably would like to have one operation. So 
how to combine these operations. So we have learned, I know literature data is completely variable, but we have learned from our own experience that if you're doing a light sided colonic resection, you're reasonably safe to do a major liver resection. The reasoning behind that is when you do a major liver resection, let's say, assume it's a right hemic hepatectomy, you are creating an essential portal hypertension. In the sense, 100% of your portal flow now is just going towards your left lobe alone. So there's a relative portal hypertension. So this can cause increased back pressure and can cause bowel edema. So this can lead to your anastomotic leak. So that's the theory behind. And following any major liver resection, you would have noticed that there's a significant drop in your albumin. So pre-op would be significantly good albumin of 40, 45, suddenly just bang, post-op it's 25, you know, 15. So they all will have significant hypoproteinemia. So that will lead to edema. And again, there's increased risk of leak. So for this reason, we prefer not to combine, but however, with the right side colonic region, it's reasonably safe because your ileum has got a good blood supply and the anastomosis usually doesn't leak. However, with the left side of the section, we prefer not to undertake any major liver resections because of the anastomotic risk, risk leak. Having said that, now the more and more patients are getting diverted or having uh, um, ileostomy along with anastomosis. It may be worthwhile considering the major resections in those situations. But currently, in our center, we don't combine a left cell resection with a major liver resection. So I'll briefly touch upon intraoperative strategies. This is probably you're all familiar with the HPV surgeons. It's just probably a better and better. But for those who are general surgeons, this just give you a brief idea of this. Um, so adequate um, exposure is the key. So be liberal with the incision. Having said that, we do a lot more, lot more uh, laparoscopic resections nowadays. But if you're doing an open, just we use something called a reverse L incision or a J incision, which runs from the epigastric region to just above the umbilicus and all the way to the right side. And intraoperative ultrasound is a key and is a must. Without intraoperative ultrasound, we should not be doing liver resections. This is, helps to both, one, to identify the lesion, second, to know the vascular anatomy, and third, the relationship of the vascular anatomy to your lesion in question so that you can plan your resection. And the third, fourth thing is to identify any new lesions. Again, the key concept is mobilize the liver. But the important point to know here is mobilize the liver which you're going to take out. So don't necessarily mobilize the whole liver. You shouldn't be really doing that. If you're, for example, if you're doing a right hemihepatectomy, don't mobilize the left lobe. You're creating lots of addition. You're making your next operation difficult in case if the patient were to develop a new metastasis on the left side. So the key thing is just mobilize the liver, which is needed. But for, for cholangiocarcinomas, it's a completely different ballgame. But as far as colorectal liver metastasis is concerned, just mobilize the liver what's needed uh, to be taken out. So aim for a macroscopic margin for at least one centimeter, so that your microscopic margin is at least one, one millimeter. Again, ICG can help you with this to get a, a right margin, but I'll touch upon ICG later. The key thing is to minimize blood loss. That's where we have made a significant improvement in liver resections compared to 15, 20 years ago. So I routinely Pringle, but not everyone does it. Some of my colleagues don't do it, but it makes a huge difference. The morbidity is more from a blood loss than an intermittent Pringle. So I do a Pringle of 15 minutes on and five minutes off. And I've done, done a maximum of 180 minutes without a problem. And the key thing is to have a low CVP. So the way we do this is tell your answer this, nice head up uh, that helps during the CVP. Normally keep that on one, two, preferably zero. And uh, hemostasis at the end and, and biliostasis are, are key to avoid any morbidities. So basic instruments, so good retraction is a key. I think uh, most of the centers in the world use Thompson's now. Um, I, I'm, I'm old fashioned and use something called a Stiber, which I've used during my training days. It gives me good exposure. Probably Suchinta and Bhutika will know what, what Stiber is, but Thompson's is very widely used. Um, again, mentioned about interpretive ultrasound. Energy devices, the number of energy devices available to pick up from um, nowadays. So how many devices are good to cut through a first couple of centimeters of liver? They're very good, hemostatic. And if you're doing non-anatomical resections, you can pretty much manage with them as long as there are no major vascular inflow pedicles or outflow pedicles. Some people use something called a Lotus, which is a new device. It's, it's a harmonic, but the way it vibrates is different from the way the traditional harmonic uh, vibrates. It vibrates horizontally. Uh, or rotational vibration. So 
the risk of vascular injuries apparently is less with that. Uh, and I've used them and I, I, uh, I don't have any conflict of interest, but yeah, I find that useful. Uh, ligature or a bipolar device, they are good for hemostasis, but they're not ideal for a liver resection because one, they get charred very quickly, they get stuck. And the uh, second thing, they produce a lot of smoke, especially for, for laparoscopic, it can be a bit of a hindrance. Um, so for that reason, I use bipolar still for controlling hemostasis at the cut surface or small blood vessels, but they're not a good ideal device for transacting through the liver, liver parenchyma. I personally feel CUSA is a must. I know with the current robotic, people tend to try and not use CUSA, but I think CUSA is a very important, elegant device to use for any liver surgeons. And there are different ways of doing liver sections. You can just cut it and take it out like a butcher, or you just do it in a nice, elegant way. If you want to do it in a nice, elegant way, you need CUSA. It's like an art, the way you need to learn to use CUSA. And uh, Pringle, a standard thing. Again, lots of people use different things like Foley's catheter. I use just a tape and um, a drain, 26 French drain. That's ideal it's just to lock it very easily and unlock it easily. Um, I think I'm missing something here. One slide, maybe. Yeah, no. Types of liver section. So again, the different ways of classifying types of liver section. So anatomically, it can be minor and major. So major is where we take three or more segments of the liver. Like this, on the left hepatectomy, you take three, two, three, and four. Or right hepatectomy, which is five, six, seven, eight. But technically, a major liver section is one which is challenging to do. Like central hepatectomy, again, it amounts to anatomical major as well, where you take three or more segments, uh, four, five, and eight. But for example, your posterior sectionectomy, which is uh, uh, six and seven. So it's technically one of the major operations, but anatomically it's minor, but we would call it as major. So these definitions have changed now based on the laparoscopic approaches. So from the laparoscopic point of view, the majors are classified based on technical difficulties. Again, another way of um, debating liver resection is anatomical as a non-anatomical resection. Some people call non-anatomical as wedge resections. So where you try and take a wedge of the tumor with a margin of one to two centimeters all around. So again, there is a significant move from anatomical major liver, liver resections to parenchymal sparing liver resection. So we tend to do more and more. So there is a publication from uh, um, uh, Torsoli from Italy who does a crazy multiple non-anatomical liver, liver resections. So uh, in one of the talks I invited him to do, he said he took around 80 lesions. I just can't believe it. It's you can do that many. It, it's almost like a Swiss cheese. So, but it is feasible for sur surface lesions. But the concerns initially raised with these non-anatomical resections were significant blood loss and uh, more R1 resections. I think with expertise now, we have reduced that significantly, um, especially with liberal use of Pringles and uh, reducing a CVP. The blood loss component is significantly reduced. Again, R1 resections, we do know that it's not as important as in other cancers, for example, primary or HCCs. So, so, R, so there are a number of papers which says R0 status and R1 status does not matter in terms of long-term survival. But again, that's a bit nebulous. It's very tricky to say categorically that way. But what we definitely know for sure is an R1 vascular has got the same long-term survival as an R0. So what I mean by R1 vascular is a lesion which is touching any major pedicle, inflow or outflow, if you can't resect the vessel because you're going to compromise the FLR, so you accept that it's going to R1 and just peel it off the vessel. So if you do that one, you know that it's going to come back microscopic as R1. But these patients have the same outcome in the long term in terms of five-year survival as an R0. So this is again a paper published by uh, Torsoli. The reasoning behind is we think the colorectal meds just push the blood vessels rather than infiltrate, again, unlike HCCs. So don't deny surgery because somebody has got a large lesion pushing on the middle hepatic vein, for example, and if you take that out, your FLR is going to be small. So R, accept R1 vascular as good as R0. Okay. So this, I've just put a video of a lap right hemihepatectomy. I did a uh, some time ago. So this is just show, because it's much easier to show a lap video than an open one because you can record it easily. So, but the steps are essentially the same. This is just to cover the different steps of a, a right hemihepatectomy. So it's exactly the same as open. You don't change any steps because it's lab. 
So this is just to do the gallbladder. You're just taking the cystic artery and the cystic uh, duct, then the hilar dissection. So the first thing is to get the right hepatic artery. Um, so this is to, so you're quite safe to hold the artery gently with your Johann forceps, both the artery and the vein, they're quite safe structures. And diatomy is a fantastic device because you can do a nice, precise dissection of the hilum, uh, unlike your, your other energy devices. So that's the right hepatic artery sloped. And then you're looking for the right uh, portal vein. So as I said, it's quite a, a useful device to hold and gently pull the portal vein. And the, the key, key component of this step is to make sure you are seeing the origin of your left portal vein. So what you don't want is assuming your right portal vein and then you're dealing with the main portal vein. So again, a trial clamping is vital in this stage to make sure that you are doing only the right portal vein. So, so you can trial clamp using either a bulldog or using a big vascular clamp. So bulldog is, is uh, good, but taking it out can be a bit of a challenge. So I use this long vascular clamp to trial clamp the vein. Sometimes you still may not see the demarcation well, so you may have to clamp the artery as well and see. But in this case, as you can see, there is a clear demarcation. So then the right hepatic artery is uh, clipped and uh, divided. So we use this uh, short hemologs. So again, a lot of people tend to tie. If you can tie, it's good as well because when you are using a stapler for the bile duct at some point, these hemologs do come in your way. So that's why I switch over to five millimeters for the artery and, and what the big ones, gold ones for the vein. So, so this is the right portal vein. So it's not a good uh, clip to go in first. So I change my angle and then come from the left side. And uh, so that's the right uh, portal vein. So again, two clips on the side which you're going to preserve and one on the right side, on one on the side which is going to come out. And so the portal vein is divided safely. And um, we don't take the bile duct extrahepatically at all because of risk, significant risk of injury to the contralateral bile duct. So always take the bile duct intraparenchymally. So then mobilize the right lobe. Uh, this step could be a bit challenging in big bulky livers. So I use this, uh, the fan retractors sometimes can poke into the liver, um, especially with the ischemic liver because you have divided your inflows. So it's important to use this, uh, something called a, we call it pretzel or, or a, um, I think it's just a gold finger which is turned around. And you use it as a dynamic retractor with your right hand and then dissect with your left hand. So the short hepatic veins are all taken down using using five millimeter hemolog clips. Uh, and smaller ones, you can safely take it just with ligature. And then you mobilize um, from the top end, from the falciform. The right lobe is completely mobilized, then get the Pringle on. So we have this something called a, a Johan, which can bend. That takes literally two minutes to get your Pringle taper on. So you use a 26 uh, millimeter uh, uh, drain. And if you're a light hepatectomy, use it on the left side. And for left hepatectomy, you use the pringles from the right side port. So, so that it doesn't come in your way. So then mark your caudate uh, uh, transaction mar margin line and uh, on the main uh, demarcation line. And as I mentioned, CUSA is an important instrument to have. Um, so dissect, so that's a segment five vein you can see. So essentially, if you're doing a right hepatectomy, the two big veins you're going to come across are your segment five and segment eight vein, apart from your inflow and outflow. There may be some small veins. So it's very important to read the preoperative CT thoroughly to see, based on your line of transaction, what vessels you're going to come across. So that will prepare yourself to deal with these vessels, one. And second, you know that you're not inadvertently dividing some other vessel which is going to the left side. So it's important to have a thorough knowledge of your preoperative CT and plan the operation. So they said, so essentially two big veins are five and eight, but there won't be only one five and one five eight. So you may have more than one. So that you will know based on your preoperative CT. So, so keep all the instruments ready. So we use on the left side. Uh, so this is just to show that different gadgets we have. So this is just a bipolar device to control surface hemostasis. So the use the cues on the left side and the bipolar on the left. Uh, so it cues on the right side and bipolar on the left. So that way it proceeds very quickly. So I'm trying to isolate the bright hepatic duct now. So once you have the right hepatic duct, safely staple it. So you, I tend to use the vascular stapler uh, cartridges. They are much safer rather than blue. And then continue the further transactions. So that's the segment eight vein. 
So again, uh, probably uh, the hemolog was a bit heavy on that. So you will see a bit of bleed now from a tear between the eight vein and the middle hepatic vein. So you can see that. So that's just lucky that you can see the hole there. So the key way to manage is increase your CVP, uh, sorry, increase your uh, intra-abdominal pressure and ask the anesthetist to lower the chest pressure so that helps to control it temporarily till you isolate. Don't try and randomly clip it, to isolate the CUSA. I was lucky here to get all of it. So, so if not, the best way to do is just put one, one suture. So even if you don't know how to tie a knot, it's fine. Put a suture, lift it up and put a clip on that. So it'll temporarily give you control and it's a venous bleed, it'll only stop. So then you can carry on. So that's the right hepatic vein. You can see the edge of the stapler, the right hepatic vein. So, so that's uh, taken down with the stapler. Make sure before you divide that your cava is completely free. Is it not, not uncommon to just take the cava off there at the top end. So the, any bile leak, residual bile leak. So the way I check is I leave the Pringle on. So you will see any uh, bile leak. It's a non-physiological way of testing it, but it's safe and it is a robust way of, of uh, checking. So once you see that, you, you put a suture. And it's very important to you, you tie the falciform back so the liver doesn't rotate. Probably it's okay with the left triangle ligament holding onto it, but I would prefer to just hold the, uh, the suture it so that the liver doesn't fall back and kink the outflow especially. So coming to bilobal liver metastasis, um, there are a number of strategies I mentioned. Uh, the commonly used ones are conventional one with portal vein embolization, but we have stopped doing that now. We do something called dual vein embolization which means it's a portal vein and the hepatic vein. The advantages are it gives you good hypertrophy a short period of time. And ALPS, I'll touch upon ALPS, and um, you can combine liver resection with ablation as well if uh, as a, one of the strategies for uh, bilobal disease. So conventional two-stage resection. So yeah, what essentially you're trying to do is you clear the future liver remnant of any disease. And then you like Give the portal vein on the disease side, or you do embolization. Again, the number of randomized trials comparing them, embolization is far better than ligation in terms of hypertrophy. The reason being, when you ligate, you're ligating the main inflow. So it's very likely you'll develop collaterals and your hypertrophy is not adequate. With the embolization, you are going distally and occluding in individual branches. So that way, the collateralization is less likely and you get a good hypertrophy. So if you can logistically get uh, embolization quickly in your center, better to go for it. But if you think your radiologist have to wait for six weeks to do embolization, then you just tie it off intraoperatively. And then reassess conventionally, we say four to six weeks time, but that's what it takes to, to hypertrophy. Again, there are a number of studies comparing kinetic growth factors and all that. So essentially the bottom line is you need four to six weeks. So if adequate FLR, then you resect the disease lobe. So that's what the two-stage liver resection means. So as you can see, this is just a, a schematic representation. So you clear on all the sites, embolize it or ligate it. So what's the downside of doing a two-stage liver resection? So your liver may not grow, the FLR, so lack of hypertrophy. So one third of them may not grow or inadequate hypertrophy, it just grows, but it's not still adequate enough. So combining these two, one third of your patients still won't get adequate FLR despite PVE disease progression. So you may take it out, but then you get a new MET on the FLR. So again, you get around 25 to 30% of patients developing new disease in the FLR or progression of the disease in your disease side. So essentially only one third of this patient or to 40% where you can go ahead and do a second stage. And be mindful, you're going two big operations. So the morbidity is all twofold. So we come up with this dual vein embolization to, to counteract these disadvantages. So where your hypertrophy is much quicker and where because you can go for the second stage quicker, your disease progression is less likely. So I'll just give you a simple example of one patient um, we did uh, uh, three years ago. So you can see different CT slices with bilobar disease. So I think I've got a CT, a dynamic CT as well, where you can see. So you can see the right-sided lesion, as it comes up, it involves the right hepatic vein. As you can see, it's just involving the right hepatic vein. So your right lobe has to go. And then you've got another lesion on the left side involving segment two and three. 
And as you further go down, there's another lesion coming up in the falciform ligament, which is going low down, but sparing segment three inflow and segment four B inflow. And then further low down, you get, I think, segment six, there's another lesion. So doing it all in one go, it's likely to result in inadequate FLR and risk of port hepatic liver failure. So we did, we did a spec scan. I don't have the picture of spec scan here. So we didn't proceed with one stage. So what we did is we cleared in the first stage non-anatomical resection of the left lobe lesions, including the one in the falciform ligament with an R0 margin. And then we have done this dual vein embolization. So I don't know if you can see in the first picture, there is a coil there, like a long wire, diamond-shaped wire. So that's hexagonal wire. So that's the coil in the hepatic vein. So that's in the right hepatic vein. So that you drew through a transjugular route. And then you go for the conventional port vein embolization through transabdominal using ultrasound. So here you can see the right anterior pedicle and then the right posterior pedicle, both are, both are uh, embolized. So essentially you're blocking off the complete flow to the right side, leaving it only on the artery so that it doesn't across. And this is a CT pretty much four weeks post embolization, but now we don't wait four weeks. We tend to do it two, three weeks and most of them have good hypertrophy. This is very early on when we started. So, as you can see, the previous resection margins and good hypertrophy in four weeks. And we did a SPECT scan. As you can see, the functional vo volume is significant, 45. And then your uh, functional um, percentage is 4.71, which is more than adequate. So we went ahead and did a uh, right hemipetectomy, second stage. And that's the CT. I think it's nine, 10 months down the line. I can't see on the top. I think it's nine months down the line. Um, so you can see a complete right hepatectomy and the FLR, I mean, the volume has really grown well and no evidence of recurrence. And this patient is still on follow up. Uh, this slide was prepared a while ago, so I haven't put the up to date slide, but he was reviewed, I think, three months ago, still without recurrence. Coming to ALPS, um, so you've heard this terminology, ALPS, it stands for Associating Liver Partition with Portal Vein Ligation for Stage Hepatectomy. So essentially it's similar to what I described with slight variations. The variations are aimed at the problems encountered with the conventional two-stage, like disease progression and lack of hypertrophy. So you do exactly the same conventional two-way, you clear the FLR of disease, you ligate the disease low, portal vein, but what you also do is you split the liver where you're going to split, uh, divide in future. So the idea is you cut off all the collaterals. The theory behind this, the liver sometimes doesn't hypertrophy purely because there's collateral circulation established. We know this based on something called CERT. So selective internal radiotherapy we use for, for uh, or TAS, we use for HCCs. So when you block blood supply to one side, you get cross circulation within seconds. So that's what leads to the lack of hypertrophy. So based on this principle, if you divide the liver and cut off the cross, cross collaterals, you're likely to develop significant hypertrophy. So, and that's the theory behind. So what you do in first stage is you isolate and preserve the artery, the bile leg, and you isolate the hepatic vein because when you go back, it's all going to be stuck. So you need sloops there. So all, don't use non-dissolvable, uh, uh, sloops, use threads, so that if you don't have to go back for some reason or other, you can leave, safely leave them. And the key thing is put some form of non-adhesive covering on the split liver. Because when you go back second time, in two, three weeks time, it's completely plastered. So you don't know where things are, the risk of injury, white structures is, is high. So we use this, uh, something called a separate film, which are quite expensive. You put it on the, uh, between the liver and the chest wall and between the split livers. And then reassess in seven to 10 days time. If it's adequate, then go ahead. So this is the schematic representation again. So the key difference basically is isolating all the pedicles and dividing the liver. So there's something called a partial alpha where people now instead of dividing the whole liver, they partially divide to, to increase the interleukin mechanism which facilitates hypertrophy. So again, there's lots of data on that. Some people still do that. So this is one of our early stages where we did ALPS. Uh, as you can see, some separate films there. This is the first stage. This is a CT. You can see in, in a week's time, 
can see significant hypertrophy of the FLR. And then we went ahead and the second stage. You can see it's all completely plastered. So it's not an easy operation. So, it, so this, I think, it just says the mechanism behind. But it fell out of fashion now, purely because of high morbidity. Uh, uh, from the significant inflammatory response people develop, the risk of wild leak, and the mortality is not insignificant either. So and the, it did not significantly reduce your post-hepatic liver failure either. So that's why it fell out of fashion. And one important risk factor we found in our center, again, uh, Suchinta and Mutika would have been there at the time, is young age. So anybody less than 60, they couldn't withstand two big operations in a week's time. So they had a very bad outcome. So we made it sure that they have, sorry, more than 60. So we made it sure that they have to be young enough if they have to go for ALPS. But with the dual vein embolization, we have completely stopped doing ALPS now. I think most of the centers in UK have done the same now. So it's fallen out of fashion. So briefly to touch upon ICG guided surgery. Uh, as I mentioned, ICG is exactly similar to your bilirubin and your technetium mebrofenate. So excreted in the, in the bile without any metabolism. And uh, it's very useful in, in superficial lesions in laparoscopic surgery. So again, with robotic surgery, it's more, more commonly used now. When do you give it? It's variable. If you want to delineate only the bile duct anatomy, you can give it an induction, for example, in lap coles or robotic coles. But if you want to delineate a lesion, it has to be given the day before. So ideally 24 to 48 hours. But because of the logistic problem we have, we can't admit a patient 48 hours before. So we get them the day before for surgery and give them so it slightly has an impact on our length of hospital stay, which are very, very important to, to uh, in the current climate to have uh, bed, or bed vacancies for us to proceed with surgery every day. So we don't use routinely yet, um, but this is something which would be very useful in laparoscopic and robotic surgery for superficial lesions. Again, this paper is just published. Uh, <coughs> so they're saying that it's, it should be less than two centimeters deep to identify the lesion. But the more important thing I found out of this is your R0 resections are much better. Because what you see macroscopically in ultrasound, if you go by that, you can you may get sometimes R1, but if you go by ICG, you go by the staining, which is always a much wider margin. So it significantly improves your R0 resection rate. So this is um, just, to, it's very uncommonly done, but uh, it's good to know. Um, High-end surgical procedures still are feasible for colorectal liver metastasis. So total vascular exclusion, either anti-cytum resection or x to resection. So when do we do this? So tumors which are very uh, at the confluence of the hepatic veins and the cava. So if they're involving that, you don't have an option. Even if it's a small tumor or a big tumor, you can consider total vascular exclusion. So what do I mean by anti-cytum resection? It's essentially you preserve the hilar structures, basically preserve the inflow, but you detach the outflow and uh, resect the tumor and then plumb it back. So your inflows, you have not done anything or you do something to the inflow, but I'll come to that in the detail. I've got a video as well. The X side tool is, means, as, you, as the terminology means, you take the liver out. So it's a total vascular exclusion. You can preserve the cava, depending on whether it's involved or not. You take it out, reset the tumor, and then put it back like an auto-transplantation. Sometimes you may have a cava involvement. So I've got a case next week. We have one cable leomyosarcoma involving the cable confluence, a hepatic veins on the right lobe of the liver extending up to the left hepatic vein. So we are planning for this one, which is uh, XA2 with cable resection, where you take the cable out after total vascular exclusion, use a cadaveric graft, and they either use a complete wheel venous bypass, which is preferable, or you can use, use a portal cable shunt as well. So I've got a video for the anti I think, and then I'll show you some uh, uh, pictures of the XA2. So this is the, these are the steps for a total vascular exclusion. So essentially you have to cut off the blood supply to the liver, which means you are putting a clamp in the suprahepatic cava, infrahepatic cava, and the inflow, which is the hepatic artery and the portal vein. Then you establish a venovenous bypass. So we prefer to use a superior mesenteric vein and the left femoral vein. So the left femoral vein is quite easy to do. It's like the central line. You just put a line there. While the SME, you use a cadaveric graft because you don't want to put a cannula into the SME because if it thrombosis, it's got a significant uh, increases the mortality. So you put a small graft onto the side wall of SME, use the graft to put the cannula. So I'll show you the video. And uh, we bypass it through the cardiopulmonary pump into the internal jugular vein. Some people through the axillary vein, but all our patients have a, a central line. And so 
you can use it to the internal jugular vein. So then you cool the liver. So use HTK uh, through the remnant portal vein, whichever is going to stay. You cool the liver and also use ice to surface cool. Then you resect and then whatever vein you have to reconstruct, reconstruct and then in X2, obviously you have to put the liver back. I think I have got a video. I'm just worried that it may not play. Now this is just show, you know, venous. as I said, we use internal jugular, not the axillary vein. This is just a pictorial representation. So this is a video of, so this is, uh, thanks to my colleague, unfortunately he's no more, Professor Meisen, it's a case we did together. Um, so this is, uh, uh, divide, you divide the diaphragmatic vein, so that gives you good length of the suprahepatic cable, it gives you at least a centimeter to a centimeter and a half. So as you can see, there's a good length of uh, suprahepatic cable. So that's very crucial to clamping it at the top. So intraoperative ultrasound shows that the venous confluence is involved. So in this case, we are planning for an extended left, but the tumor is involving the right uh, hepatic vein at its origin and also the anterior wall of the cava. So that's the reason we are doing an anti-cytum resection. Can you still see the video, yeah? Yes, we can see. Okay, thank you. So, so again, this is we're coming to the inflow side. So we're dividing all the short hepatic veins to get uh, good control of the infra uh, hepatic cava. So yeah, so again, back to the inflow, trying to get both the hepatic veins extra hepatically. So the key here is to preserve the right portal vein and divide the left, left portal vein. So what you essentially do is you ligate the left portal vein, make a hole in the right portal vein and put your cannula in. This is to cool the liver. That comes at a later stage. So this is the whole uh, pedicle loop. So now this is what I was mentioning about the bypass. So we are isolating the SME, the infracolic compartment. So you open the SMV, put a, a graft on top of that. Uh, we use a cadaveric graft, just group match, but it's not going to stay in. A part of it will stay in when we divide at the end, because we don't take it out, we just staple it off. So this is the graft which has gone onto the side wall of the SMV. So you just put one of the Y cannulas. So your cannula has got a Y connector. So one end goes into the SMV and another end goes to the left. So this is the one end of the Y cannula. This is to divert your portal flow. And then you've got, we are putting the left femoral line now under uh, ultrasound guidance. So this is like putting a central line in using a Seldinger technique. So this now is established with your, or, yeah, this is into the portal vein now. We've gone quickly into the portal vein. This is to, flush with the cold HDK to preserve your right lobe. You don't tie it, you use a scoop and just snug it. So now the SMV, so this is, we are partially dividing the liver, then we'll start the venous bypass soon. So suprahepatic cava uh, clamped, infrahepatic cava, so this is suprahepatic, sorry, infrahepatic and suprahepatic both clamped, venous bypass is on, you can see no blood now. So we're just transacting the liver. So we're going to preserve, keep the inflow. So we're just going to take the top, you'll see in a minute. So you just do like a standard uh, resection. They put uh, ice for surface cooling as we go along. So now you can see the posterior capsule being divided. So this is the right hepatic vein, right, which we need to preserve, but part of it is involved. So we've divided the right hepatic vein now. We need to reconstruct that. So we divided it off the cava. So this is the one which we are going to preserve. This is your FLR. So now we are coming on the left side. So you're taking the left side off completely from the cava. So we are reconstructing the right hepatic vein. So again, use a graft. So attach it to the end of your right hepatic vein so that you get length to put it back onto the cava. So we've got a surplus uh, supply of cadaveric vein because of the transplant program, which is very handy but you can always use a Dacron patch or a PTFE patch to reconstruct it back onto the cava. So now it's being um, anastomosed to the cavotomy where the previous stump of the vein was. So now the outflow 
is reconstructed. As you know, the inflow has not been divided at all. That's a big advantage of anti-cyclone resection. So you have significantly low mobility from the inflow reconstruction. So you're not doing your artery with the risk of thrombosis, not bile duct with the risk of uh, biliary leak or long-term long stricture. So if you can do an anti it's better. So, so now you're taking the left lobe off. It's all taken out with the tumor. So the stump of the left hepatic vein now is being sutured. So you can see the flow is being reestablished, as you'd expect. There is a bit of ooze, but it all stops. And the clamp is removed. We just simply staple the graft which we put. We just use a stapler, just divide that off so that you don't disturb the SME at all. So put a hemostatic patch and then good flow to, to the liver. So that's a good uh, technique if you can do the anti -cytum. So I'll show you a case of an X situ resection again, a large uh, lesion, as you can see, it's pressing onto the middle vein. And it's middle vein and the left vein confluence, actually. You can't see in that cut clearly. So X2 stages are pretty much uh, similar. Uh, you, if you have to re reset the cava, it's a lot more challenging. So in this case, yes, we have to replace the cava. So you mobilize the liver, take the whole thing and block the liver with the cava and take the tumor out in the back bench. If you have a venous bypass, it's much better. If not, you can use a portal cable shunt just to divert the portal flow. And for the venous, you can establish the flow after the graft. Quick, some pictures. They're all still pictures because it was such a high stress operation. We couldn't video this. Uh, so this is the liver being mobilized and the liver being explanted there. You can see the portal cable shunt onto the reconstructed uh, cava here. So that's the neo cava using two iliac veins. And this is the portal cable shunt. So we established the four. So from the limbs, the blood normally flows through the cava, so no venous bypass here now. And the portal cable shunt obviously decompresses your portal venous system. And this is the X C2 back in the uh, back bench. You can see the tumor is being resected. It's all out and reconstruction happening. Uh, briefly to touch upon the trials, which I was part of with all European trials. So orange two plus trial is a, it's a randomized trial comparing lap versus open major hepatectomies, including right and left. So we were the highest recruiters and uh, this paper is just, I think, published. Um, so we had around uh, 250 in each arm. So significant improvement in functional recovery following laparoscopic surgery. The length of stay is only one day better with lap. I think it's five days versus open, which is six days, but the functional recovery is much better. So patients get back to work much earlier. Analgesic requirement is much earlier. So the same thing continued with the orange segments trial, which is used for a posterior and superior segments. So uh, a segment eight lesion can be extremely challenging because you can't really rotate the liver compared to segment seven lesion. So it's hinged against the hepatic vein. So it's a lot more challenging to do a segment eight one. Um, and uh, obviously the posterior sectionectomies, which are even challenging as an open operation. So this is another trial. Again, we completed, we were the highest recruiters. Uh, data is being analyzed still, uh, it'll be published soon. And then the EMT2 trial, which is uh, a fish oil uh, versus placebo, which on pilot study, we know that it significantly improved the five-year survival uh, on patients who had fish oil from before surgery to four years after surgery. So the trial is still ongoing. We are completing it recruitment. And the fourth trial we just started, which is uh, very um, uh, surgically, it's not a surgical trial, but it is on the effect of chemotherapy where we increase the effect of chemotherapy by doing high frequency ultrasound and creating cavitation. So the day before surgery, they have a high dose, single dose of chemotherapy, and we use ultrasound to cavitate the lesion and focus the chemotherapy into the lesion so that it increases the concentration of chemotherapy and the long-term survival benefit. It's just an ongoing pilot study, phase two trial. We just started, we recruited two patients. It's in com combination with Oxford. And uh, I'm not put, put it here. It's called the CEED trial. And uh, hopefully we will have the uh, phase two report in the next year or so. I think that concludes my presentation. Very happy to take any questions. Uh, Mr. Ravi, what is your appreciation in the case of indeterminate small liver lesions on CT and MRI, especially with the normal CEA level? Thanks, Bhutika uh, and Suchinta. So if it's indeterminate, the options are uh, twofold. 
One, uh, you can do a CT PET. So it may give you an idea. Uh, but again, we don't, if it's a small lesion, it's okay for, for CT PET. Again, we need to be aware of limitations of CT PET. Because in somebody who has had chemotherapy, your CT PET is very unreliable. So you have to give six weeks post CT, uh, post chemotherapy to have your CT PET. But if it's a large lesion, if you have a low threshold to biopsy them. So if it is inconclusive on CT and MR, if it's reasonably accessible to biopsy, biopsy it. But if you can't biopsy, if it's too small, even to characterize by CT PET, the only option is just surveillance scan. So you're safe to, because if it's a small lesion, it's not going to become inoperable in three months time. So do a surveillance scan in three months down the line, no improve, no change, just monitor. Whenever it goes bigger, one, you're able to characterize or you're able to biopsy. So small lesion, you're safe to just monitor them. I hope I've answered your question, Mudika. Uh, and then there's another question. What are the surgical options, principles for metachronous liver meds following resection of synchronous liver metastasis? So, yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's like a redo liver resection. Yes, so basically patient has got recurrence after a synchronous liver resection. Yes, you can resect. So the maximum we have done is four times in the same patient. So you can keep resecting liver as long as you've got adequate FLR. So that's a key. So make sure you've got adequate FLR. So the key here is the spec scan in all these patients. And most of the time we are talking about one major resection, usually a right or a left, then the further resections are all small NARs. But the surgery is going to be challenging because of lots of additions. And unfortunately what you see in these patients are usually a recurrence happening at your cut surface, which is the most annoying place to have a recurrence because either your inflow or outflow is very close by. So it's very important to get preoperative imaging. So in those situations, apart from SPECT, to check for adequate functional FLR, it's also important to have a good anatomical reconstruction using those uh, special scans I mentioned about maybe or synapse, so you can plan your operation properly. But yeah, you can do as many times as you want, provided you've got adequate FLR. So uh, I also have a question. Uh, now Birmingham being, being a hepatobiliary center and also transplant center, what's your experience on these patients who have unresectable liver meds? Uh, is a liver transplant an option? Like have you had done uh, any, yeah. any transplants? Yeah, it's a very, very, very good question, Sajinta. Uh, the problem we have in Europe or, or in UK, I would say, I shouldn't say Europe because uh, Oslo is different. Oslo has got surplus organs. They use transplant for colorectal meds. So there's a study called the uh, uh, Oslo Comet study. So where they provide, it's concluded that tra transplant is a feasible option in colorectal meds with good survival. But the problem is we don't have surplus liver. So that's where the problem comes. So people are, people are fighting for a limited resource. So in centers where there's live donor transplant, it's a completely different ball game. I presume Live donor is a, it's a common phenomenon in Sri Lanka. So it's a different ball game. So you are probably able to do that. But what we have started doing in, in the UK now, we have had uh, three committees set up, one for colorectal liver meds, uh, looking at transplant option, second one on uh, hyalocholangia carcinoma, and third one on neuroendocrine tumors. So we've got three steering group committees looking at option of transplant for these ones. So we have come up with the initial uh, inclusion criteria, it's very strict, you won't believe. It has to be the liver only met, which makes sense. You can't have extra hepatic disease. But the biggest problem is the disease needs to be stable for two years with chemotherapy. So oncologists are completely upset, but they have to give chemo for two years. So the patients are upset because they have to wait for two years before making a decision whether it's going to be transplanted or not. But the reasoning to come up with that, you have to show disease stability before you do a transplant. You don't want to waste an organ, which is so precious. So the only way to assess stability is just give time and see what happens. So keep them under chemotherapy. So it's not very well received, but that's the current criteria we've got. So we have started this, but we are not standing anyone yet. But I presume, I gather that there's one patient who is being set up either in Kings or Royal Free somewhere in London. But uh, that's where our experience is with regards to transplant for, um, for colorectal meds. So uh, we have another question from Nrohoshan Atalogama. So his question is now, when you give uh, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy for correct liver metastasis, and if some of the lesions disappear, what would you do? 
or, or do you do something like marking the lesions before new ajuan no it's very very again a very interesting question and commonly faced problem so there are two types of disappearing lesions so one let's say in somebody with multiple lesions and some of them disappear so they are slightly easier to manage because the other ones need intervention so you are going in you see what has happened to the disappeared lesion on intraoperative ultrasound so most of them you will see a surface scar that's my experience you will de see a surface scar so what i do is just burn it with with just a diathermy on the surface if it's a deeper lesion just burn it with rfa but the problem comes in somebody who has one or two lesions which have disappeared we know from studies that a uh, radiological response is not a pathological response so 85% of the patients who have a complete radiological response will have disease recurrent at some point so only 15% of them will have a true pathological response so if you the options are uh, or the only option we have at the moment what we do is if it's a complete radiological disappearance we don't do anything so we just continue to monitor and surveillance with short intervals we do a three monthly to start with so if it comes up deal with it at the time if it doesn't come up you have to assume it's a pathological response uh i think there's a someone has raised the hand rcs hi uh ravi uh uh this is rohan i'm i work with uh, suchinta uh ravi thank you very much for sparing your time on a sunday evening uh uh, uh to give that this wonderful talk uh so hpv surgery is actually still uh, in its development in sri lanka people like kasukinta buddhika they have uh, come back to sri lanka doing a doing a great job i have two questions ravi uh, one in training in hpv and one a clinical question uh, what is your view about uh, small lesions uh, uh maybe less than 2 cm lesions right at the deep part of the liver uh uh, uh you uh you view on microablation of the small tumors uh, uh, compared to uh, a formal resection thank you actually i should uh, i should uh, appreciate all of you for for sitting and patiently listening at 8 8:30 in the evening in sri lanka on a sunday so for me it's still still uh, day time so i really appreciate everyone's enthusiasm actually so coming to your question about uh, small lesions deep in the liver so we widely use uh, microwave ablation so if it's deep and if it's percutaneously accessible which most of the time it is so the radiologists do it but if it's not percutaneously accessible the second option is to do it laparoscopically where we mobilize the liver completely and then do it uh, as a, a lap guided rfa so for lesions less than 3 cm rfa long term outcomes are as good as surgery so for lesions more than 3 cm we try not to do an ablation we tend to do a resection because we know there is a difference in the long term survival so and the, we try doing a randomized trial between rfa and surgery uh, there is something called a lawa trial which did not complete because we couldn't recruit enough patients so the trial had to be abandoned after 2 years in all the centers we had the same problem in the uk because patients were well informed and they were coming up front with one option or another so they didn't want to go on to the randomization so it was a very difficult trial to recruit to so we had to stop that but we still go by the data from hcc which is extrapolated to colorectal liver mats where we come up with this size criteria of 3 cm the outcome is the same as uh, same as um, uh, surgery yeah so we do our use ablation and uh, with regards to your second question on training actually it's it's uh, i don't know if you want to elaborate yeah uh, yes sir so what i wanted to ask was uh, uh, still uh, uh, hpb training is in sri lanka is still evolving so uh, what is your view about how uh, there are a lot of trainees in the audience uh, so uh, how, what do you think about how, how should they start looking at uh, their uh, surgical experience in liver resection let's say for someone to start Uh, liver resection what kind of lesions they should start thinking operating first and what is the number of cases you think they should do uh, one should do to achieve competence in doing a major resection like right hepatectomy what is the number of cases in their training how how should they look at it thank you I mean, training is another uh, uh, one of my uh, keen interests because i have been a training program director now i'm on the specialist advisory committee for the uk curriculum of training 
So I'm very passionate about training. And uh, the type of liver resections, especially with the, with the uh, development of laparoscopic and robotic, it has become a key thing, you know, how people approach uh, liver resections. So again, I'll extrapolate the laparoscopic training to open resections as well. So definitely to start with minor liver resections. So what we call minor liver resections is non-anatomical resection in the anterior inferior segments. You know, segment six, segment five, segment four B or left lateral. So they are the perfect ideal ones to start with where you probably ne don't necessarily need CUSA or Pringle, but it's worthwhile using to practice. So use liberally Pringle, use the CUSA to dissect nicely the inflow and, and the entry each and every vessels and then clip it. Once you develop that expertise, then you feel much more comfortable and safe to proceed with the major liver resection. So choosing the right patients, so that's a key. So you want to choose, again, somebody with a colorectal mass previously who had an open colonic resection, you probably don't want to do them first because you're probably dividing the additions forever. Yeah? So choose somebody where there's a doubtful lesion and where you want to do a big biopsy rather than percutaneous biopsy or a peripheral cholangiocarcinoma is a good one to go for, you know, which is very small in the periphery where you want to do. You may have to do a high level lymphadenectomy, but slightly different issue. But those are the ones where you can choose to start your liver resections. And uh, with regards to the number of cases you mentioned, again, I published a paper with one of my colleagues called Rob Sutcliffe. So we did look at only the laparoscopic one, but again, we can extrapolate the data for open liver resections. So the number which we came up with was 20. So if you've done 20 minor liver resections, you are safe to proceed to a major liver resection. So again, when you're choosing your first right hepatectomy, again, choose your right rather than left. Once you get experience, your left is far more easier than your right. But when you want to do a first major liver resection, you want to do a right rather than left. The reasoning behind is your transaction plane for right is just straight from front to back to the cava. You're mobilizing the liver cava completely, short body veins, so you can go straight back from one end to another end. But when you're doing your left, you, your transaction line comes from top to halfway through, and then you have to make it horizontally to go between your cortic and left lateral. So where you turn, it's very important because you can end up damaging the right bile, bile duct. But once you get the expertise, left is much quicker, much easier to do. But if you have to start with a major liver resection, after gaining experience in minor, I would, as I said, 20, go for a right. So then you feel a lot more comfortable doing your right because you have used your cues already, you used your pingle. The only tricky step is uh, dissecting it off the cava and getting the right hepatic vein, scooping it out. So, but that will come with experience, with, with confidence. You use all the gadgets, you're feeling a lot more comfortable. So yeah, the number, if you ask for it, I would say it's 20 minor liver, liver resection before you go to major. Uh, so we have uh, two more, uh, just the last two questions. Uh, one is, uh, if you have synchronous lung and liver myths, what would you tackle first? Is it the liver or the lung? Colorectal. Yeah, so again, good question. So I have published when I was a trainee. Uh, this was in 2006 or 2007, a paper on this. Uh, um, uh, both simultaneous, uh, sorry, sequential liver and lung mets and uh, resections for that. So if they are resectable, both liver and lung, your five-year survival is exactly similar to somebody who's got only isolated liver mats. So the bottom line rational is it's worthwhile doing. So don't think that because you've got two site metastases, your outcome is bad. As long as they're resectable, it's worthwhile doing it. So that's the first line. So you accepted surgery is an option. So the next one is whether the lung is easily resectable. If they can do a VAT procedure, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery, then go for the lung and then go for the liver because the recovery is much quicker then you can do the liver. But in general, what we do in Birmingham, the practice is go for the liver. So because the belief is that your liver is always a bulky tumor and is going to be the higher burden disease and decide the outcome, I uh, mean, survival outcome. So we go for a liver first, followed by lung. So that's the current practice we have. So the other question is, uh, uh... In synchronous meds, if there's a short chemotherapy, chemoradiotherapy option selected for the rectum, would you give chemotherapy before the liver resection? Yeah, even again, when it, the resectable. Even, even when the oh, liver metastases are, are resectable. 
Yeah. So if it is synchronous, they all would have had upfront chemo anyway. So and the disease control is with, with the local short course chemo after that. So again, the chemo there is just a 5FU as a radio sensitizer. So because it's synchronous, even with resectable disease, so that's the move we have made recently. So before we were doing resections up front, if you could do and then give chemo later. But we have seen that the recurrence pattern is becoming more common. So even if it's a resectable liver disease with a synchronous presentation, you give them neoadjuvant chemo. So once they have neoadjuvant chemo, then control, because you know that once they have a liver resection, they're going to have a long period to recover. So generally you're expecting another two to three months before you can resect the primary. So then you control the rectum with short course chemo, RAD. So that, the chemo there is a radius, a radius sensitizer. So give a chemo RAD, then you go for liver. Sorry, uh, the short course you just follow by primary and then you do the liver. So the short course again is to control the local regional disease with regards to microvessel invasion and the lymph node disease. So they all would have had chemo anyway, systemic chemo. Thank you. Mm -hmm.